Okay. Before we get into the text, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us together again. We pray you'll be with us as we open your word to this book that gives history of your people and your dealings with them. Help us to learn those things that are most important for us. Help us to learn uh, from their mistakes so we don't make them and, and to learn from their faith so we can imitate it. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen. So, do you like complainers? I like to complain about complainers. <laughs> I suppose complainers irritate all of us. And a lot of the reason this happened um, is because Israel had a bunch of complainers and whiners and rebels. Um, I just visited somebody today who was the opposite of this. I just to bring this up. So I made a visit this afternoon to a lady here that she doesn't get out here very much because of health, but uh, she lives down in, you know, where Reflections is. Uh, Carolyn Fury. What a wonderful person to visit. If you ever want to make a visit uh, where I guarantee you will feel better when you leave, go see Carol. She just, I mean, she has a reason to complain about things. She is just positive. She loves the place she lives. She sort of enjoys her life. You know, there's no complaint. And uh, it, it's one, not everybody's like that, you know. But, but uh, she, she is like that, and, and the other side of that is, is, is Israel in this ancient time. So this middle section of the book of Numbers is really a lot of these complaints and rebellion. It runs from chapter 11 to chapter 25 of Numbers. We started looking at this last week. I wanted us to make sure we saw a few of these stories, but remember there's this pattern that develops. So the people complain. And God sends some kind of punishment on them. Varies from you know, setting to setting. Sometimes it's a plague, sometimes it's something else. He sends some kind of punishment because of their complaint. And then Moses usually intercedes on behalf of the people. God, please relent. And, and so God will. They'll pull back. And then sometimes the place is given a name as a reminder of what happened there. The complaint. All right. So it doesn't always happen that way, but that's the basic pattern. And I want us to start tonight with the situation with the spies that were sent up into Canaan. This is chapters 13 and 14. So remember there. They've come from Mount Sinai and they're heading towards the promised land and they're supposed to go right up there and take it. That's God's intention for them. He's prepared this land for them. They're supposed to go get it. All right, so initially they send the scouts to spy the land. Twelve, right? Twelve spies go up into Canaan. And they just go right up. Apparently, uh, Right in the middle here, this area, and they check it out, and they come back and and give their report. The first part of chapter 13 it lists, you know, all the all the spies who went, where they were, what tribe they were from, and so forth. Uh, but he tells them go up. Uh, Moses tells them go up, spy out the land, see what it's like, and then come back and tell us what it's like. And so they do that. This is first 20 or so verses of chapter 13 and their report is interesting this is down in verse 25 at the end of 40 days so it's 40 day trip that's an important number for our story because remember how, how long are they going to wander the wilderness 40 years it's based on 40 days. So they 
It went up after, and then after 40 days it came back. It came to all the congregation and to Moses and Aaron. And they told them, this is in verse 27 now, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. They apparently had a big bunch of grapes that they had brought back. Like the world's largest grapes or something. Okay, all right. But then verse 28. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of not there, which apparently had a, a legend that they were sort of giants, that kind of thing. Uh, and then lists some other people that are there, some other scary people like the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and so forth. So they're basically saying, yeah, it's a great land, but we, we can't handle these people. Verse 30, but Caleb, one of the spies, quieted the people before Moses and said, let's go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. <clears throat> then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up, for they are stronger than we are. So you've got Caleb saying one thing, and ten of the spies apparently saying, no, we can't do this. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people we saw of it are of great height, and that kind of, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. So here's the report we got. So far named one guy of the 12, Caleb, who says, yeah, we need to go up and take it. All of them say it's a great land, but 10 of them say we cannot do it. This is beyond us. So chapter 14, verse 1, all the congregation then raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, well, listen to what they said. Would that we had died in Egypt. Or would that we had died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? So who's one out in the report? The, the negative knowledge. <laughs> one out. They displayed the whole congregation of Israel. It says, uh, they say, our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Now, keep that in mind in mind because God's going to spit it back at them in a minute. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Let's get rid of Moses and let's go back. How quickly they forget what it was like in Egypt. So, Moses and Aaron, this is verse 5, chapter 14, fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. And Joshua, now we get the other good spy name, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, uh, they tore their clothes, sign of mourning. They tore their clothes and said to all the congregation, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. Land that flows with milk and honey. Don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. We're going to eat them up. The Lord's with us. Don't fear them. Verse 9. Then all the congregation, they didn't say, oh, you're right, we're being too pessimistic. They're not swayed by the two, Caleb and Joshua. They say, what? Let's stone them. All, all the 
congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people. So God shows up in glory at the tabernacle in the midst of the people. And the Lord speaks then in verse 11, How long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs I have done among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. What's God want to do? Start over. I'm going to start over with you, Moses. These people hate me. How long do I have to put up? How many, if they were Moses, he said, right on. They're always rebelling against him and his leader. They've just said, let's pick a new leader and go back to Egypt. But Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear about it. For you brought us up, uh, you brought this people up in your mind from among them. And they will tell the inhabitants of the land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face. Your cloud stands over them, and you go before them. And a pillar of cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, it's because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land. That he swore to give them, that he has killed them in the wilderness. You hear Moses is reasoning with God. If you do this, everybody's going to think you're, you weren't able to take the land. Think of what the nations are going to think, God, if you wipe them out. Sort of an amazing exchange. And then he starts quoting to God the word of God. Verse 18. Remember what you promised. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Moses is quoting God to God, saying, Remember what you're supposed to be like? Slow to anger? Do you ever quote scripture to God? Interesting. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. So there's the intercession. Moses, on behalf of the people, God wants to wipe them all out and start over. He says, think of what the nations are going to think. This isn't like you, Lord, to do this. And so God says, all right. Verse 20, I have pardoned according to your word. But then he says, but here's the deal. None of these people alive right now, none of this generation is going to get to see the kingdom. And for every day that the spies went and looked out the land, for 40 days, they're going to spend a year wandering around in this desolate wilderness until they die. This entire generation is going to die out. None of them will get to see it except, verse 24, my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully. I will bring him into the land. Then later on it will say, you know, it will make specific, but also Joshua. So Caleb and Joshua. They're the exceptions to this ban on this generation. <clears throat> so it goes on and talks a little bit more about that. Uh, verse 30 is where Joshua is named. Um, and you know, God, I, I said, you know, earlier when the the pessimist said, our little ones are going to be eaten up. Mm -hmm. God, that brings 
comes back to God in verse 31 says to them, your little ones who you said would become a prey, I will bring in and they shall know the land that you rejected. So you all are going to die with your kids. You were so afraid we're going to die going up into the land. They're going to get to see it. But you won't. Careful what you say to God. You're, as for you, your dead body shall fall in the world. So, that's basically how this works out. And then, after all that, so basically the sentence has been passed. You've got 40 more years here before you go up. <laughs> At the end of the chapter, notice um, Moses told the people all this. The people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the heights of the hill country saying, here we are, we'll go up to the place the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. So now we're like, we'll go now. We'll go ahead up into Canaan. We made God mad. Let's, let's fix this. We'll go ahead. And God said, no. You're not going up in there. If you go, I'm not going with you. So they send a force up into Canaan trying to fix you know, override God's sentence on them. And uh, they all get wiped out. That's how chapter 14 ends. Um, too late for them to fix it. See, God already said what was going to happen. So, um, pattern here in chapter 13 and 14 with the spies. Another place this kind of thing happens in chapter 16. This pattern of rebellion, complaint, and punishment, with what's a lot of times called Korah's rebellion. Korah was a leading Levite, and um, Korah uh, didn't like the fact that people like Moses and Aaron had these special privileges of being close to God. Okay. They got to go into the tabernacle in the presence of God. Um, Korah and his, his crew didn't. So they say, we're all holy, why can't we all do that? They're challenging, again, the, the leaders of God's people and God's, the way he had set things up. So the first part of the chapter is, is that rebellion and they're basically saying, let's, let's get rid of Moses and Aaron and let's all be able to serve in the tavern. I mean, it's only fair, isn't it? Everybody gets to do everything. Isn't that the way we think these days? Everybody should get to do everything. No matter what God said. So, might be a sign that this isn't going to work out so well for Korah and his followers. And and basically what happens is, okay, Moses says, uh, God, decide the next day who are his and who are not. And, and the way it works out is Korah and his people, uh, the earth opens up underneath their tents, swallows them all. The text says they go down alive into the shield, and it's the place of the dead, which means they weren't alive very long. Right there. Covered up in, uh, in the earth. Now, if you did see that, how do you think you'd react? What lesson might you take when the earth opened up and swallowed Korah and Dathan and Abiram and all these loud mounts in Israel? You might think. I want to figure out uh, what God wants. Uh, that makes sense to me. But that's not what happens. Look at the end of chapter 16. After all these people were killed, swallowed up. Alright, how did Israel react to people? 
On the next day, this is verse 41. All the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. assembled against Moses and against Aaron, they turned toward the tent of meeting, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from the midst of this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. So we're back to, we're going to wipe them all out. Get away. Just recently, Moses had had to do this, deal with this, right? God wanted to destroy them all when they didn't go up into the land. And Moses interceded and said, no, 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 don't do that. Here we are again. What did Moses and Aaron do? Verse 45, they fell on their faces. And Moses said to Aaron, take your censer, thing that you know, it has the incense in it that you, you burn at the tabernacle, long pole with incense in it. Take your censer and put fire on it from off the altar and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. The plague has begun. To me, I don't know a more dramatic passage in the Old Testament than these few verses that I've known. I mean, it's a sad story, but it's very dramatic what happens here. So God's ready to wipe them out. Apparently, he has sent a plague to do so. And Moses says to Aaron, hurry up, get the censer, and take it into the midst of the congregation. For the plague has begun. So, verse 47, Aaron took it, as Moses said, and ran into the midst of the assembly and made atonement for the people. He put incense and made atonement for the people. The plague had already begun among the people. And then verse 48, and he stood between the dead and the living. You see it? I mean, can you picture that? He's running into the midst of the congregation of Israel, thousands and thousands of people with this thing. On one side, everybody's dying because the plague has started. And, and on the other side, Aaron runs right in the middle of that. He stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who had died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at Entrance of the tent of meeting when the plague was stopped. I just don't know how, how you forget things like this and then turn around and do a similar thing the next day. Probably at some degree, don't we? Yeah, it reveals something about our nature and thankful that, that God doesn't exactly deal with those complaints and rebellions so immediately as he wants to do. So that's a major one, the, the rebellion of Korah and then Israel in response to that in chapter 16. Uh, in chapter 20 is one we already looked at when we take down this, this is where you know they don't have water and uh, Moses uh, steals God's glory by striking the rock instead of speaking to it. He actually loses his privilege to go up into the land of Canaan as a result of that. That's in chapter 20. Uh, but I wanted us to make sure we, we saw the one in chapter 21. So 
before we were done tonight. Because he comes back to us in the New Testament and one other place in the Old Testament. So chapter 21, we're still in the wilderness, all right? It says uh, in verse 4, from Mount Hor, we're not sure where that is, but from that mountain they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. All right, so here we are. Someplace up in here, here's Edom. The idea is that they're going to go around the land of Edom. That's where this happens. And the people became impatient on the way. Probably because they didn't take it. You know, I-70 right through the middle of Edom and went around made a longer trip. They got impatient for whatever reason. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? But there is no food and no water, and you loathe this worthless food. It's not the first time we've heard that. So the Lord then sent, not plague, but fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, you see how the pattern repeats itself? They, they come to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. At least they figured out by this time that Moses is the one who prays for them. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, this is interesting. What's, what's the cure? Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So apparently most of everybody was getting bitten. So when you get bit by one of these snakes as they're traveling past me, this, and the serpent is set up, and then you can go look on it, and you're cute. This was the shot you would take to get over the, the, the bite of the fiery serpent. So that, you know, it's sort of left there. All right. And then centuries later, our Lord is talking to Nicodemus one night, right? about all these great things, uh, you know, you must be born again, and all those in John chapter 3, and, uh, and suddenly he says to Nicodemus, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believed in him may have eternal life. So go back to this old story and then draw a parallel with what's going to happen to him. And Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross, of course. Um, but you know, we wonder you know, why study these strange stories about fire and serpents in the Old Testament. Well, Jesus uses it to sort of illustrate what he's going to do. For those cases, and several others in the Bible, um, we have to do something. And, and we have to have faith in what we're doing. I mean, God said he's really good. just got rid of his things. But the people that showed their faith in and it was reminding them of their faith to go look at this thing to be said. And with Jesus, we have to go back to the cross and, find, and to Jesus to find our salvation. Sure. We have to believe and to be baptized. The water is a symbol of our <coughs> being cleansed and being a part of the burial, rising in the life we did. But in other places, too, there was uh, the blind man where he told him to go wash in the, the one lake that was the dirtiest or whatever. And sometimes, you know, 
and it's like, but he had to do something. Jesus could have easily just given him sight back right there by saying something. Mm -hmm. But he, he made him do something to show his faith. Right. And in, in many cases, this is the act of doing something for our faith. kind of helps us to remember our faith in the crisis. I mean, when you're bit by a poison snake, and the only thing is to look at I'll tell you what, if one of those bit me, I'm running to the tent. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, with 600,000 people, how far away is that? No, it's not very far away. I'm okay. moving my tent near it. I'm sorry, because I don't do those things. That's one problem I would probably pass also. But, yeah, it's, it's an act of faith. And as long as you look, like he saved me, and it's a daily reminder to them that I'm saving you, pay attention. True. And all of these, it, when we have to do something, an act of our faith is a reminder. And all these stories are for our learning of these spiritual principles. I find it interesting that the, the process is you get bit and it says you will live. I don't know if anybody's been bitten by a snake or any kind of poisonous thing. The process is not fun. Yeah. So there's a process that would happen regardless, but it says you will live. And I find that the interesting, I find that very interesting because in the same sense with Jesus and on the cross, the idea of the life or live and things like that. It's not take, up your, take up your cross. That's not always pleasant. That's the other thing, one, one way to think about the story, God could have taken the snakes away, right? They just removed the snakes, but instead men go through this process where there was some suffering and then act of faith to get to healing. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, we learned something about God there. Steve, you had your hand up too. I was curious about the fiery serpent translation and what that would look like, but in the NIV it said calls it venomous. Venomous, yeah. Yeah, the, the word is a word, it's the word for bronze, actually, in Hebrew. So, and so you think, think of bronze, you look at it, it has that fiery nature to it. And it's interesting that the area where they were going around was full of bronze mines. In ancient times, and I think still today, there's this, you can mine copper and bronze and stuff. But, um, yes. Yeah, and the, the bite is fiery and burning and painful, that kind of thing. Uh, one, one of the places comes back, not as important as what Jesus said about it, of course, but <clears throat> if you go over to uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, so we're jumping ahead hundreds of years into you know, Israel's in the land and they've got kings. Okay? And it's the, the uh, kingship of Hezekiah, which is notable because he's one of the very few good ones. Hezekiah we know quite a bit about. Um, he began to reign, 2 Kings 18, 1. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. It tells us who his mother was. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. So good King Hezekiah. And then it talks about some of the good things he did. He removed the high places that was the illicit worship sites, and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah, those are idols. But then it suddenly says, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. So this thing that Moses set up in the wilderness on this occasion, they keep, probably as like a, I don't know, a talisman or something, they keep all the way up into the time of Hezekiah, which is a zillion generations later, and they're apparently worshiping this thing, because it's mentioned in the context of all the other false worship stuff that Hezekiah got rid of. He, he busts up this bronze serpent, 
that comes all the way back to the wilderness. And uh, I don't know what exactly what to make of that other than they seem to be worried about anything. But. You know, I think that's what we do is we make gods of the worship uh -huh. out of anything. I, I once I'll hear people say something like, well, why, why wouldn't God leave uh, the cross in some way, the actual cross? Of course, if you go to Jerusalem today, they'll take you to a place and say, here's the real cross. <laughs> Behind this glass and all this stuff. And why aren't there things like that? You know, why don't we have the original copies of Paul's letters? God could have preserved that if he wanted to. Or a chunk of the cross, and people down through time have claimed they had pieces of it, you know, wandered around and probably sold access to it. Or uh, what was it in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? The, the, uh, the, 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 the Holy Grail? Yeah, the Last Supper Cup. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't he pre preserve some things like that to inspire people? Say, it doesn't really inspire people. So look what happened with the bronze serpent. People end up worshiping that thing, right? Why not a picture of? Why don't, why don't we have some kind of ancient picture of Jesus or a shroud of the burial? The, the, he has a shroud, you know, the burial shroud of Christ. All this stuff. I mean, if that's what it takes to believe, then that's just like what they were doing with the, with that old brown serpent and. Good King Hezekiah, who understood what God wanted, came along and got rid of it. So, that, that's an interesting reflection on that. Alright, I think we got through most of the uh, complaints and murmurings. I do want us to look, if you want to look at something for next time, we're going to look at the story of Balaam, which I think is one of the most interesting stories in the Old Testament, chapter 22. 24, the story of Balaam. Usually we know what we know about that story is the talking one. Right. There's so much more in there. Uh, talking donkey is fascinating. But, uh, we'll look at that a couple other things before we do the show.